Benjamin Constant, writing on the comparison between the Athenian democratic city-state of classical antiquity and the liberal democratic state of the modern era, notes the following difference in ethos and attitude that underpins the structural and institutional makeup of the contrasting regimes. For the ancients, the liberty of the citizen was realized through his loyal action within the public sphere that stands as the epicenter of all virtue. For the moderns, by contrast, the concept of liberty entails freedom from arrest, freedom of movement, and freedom of choice away from the public sphere. Privacy in one's own home being the most sacred right of all. This contrast is first manifest in the political philosophies that mark each epoch, and it is as true of Aristotle as it is of Machiavelli. At 1252b27, the midpoint to Book 1, Chapter 2 of Aristotle's The Politics, we arrive at the polis, the final and perfect association. This phrase rendering what is a single word in Greek, teleos, indicating an end that is not sought for the sake of some further end. Unlike the male-female union, the household and the village, the polis, or city in many translations, is the height of full self-sufficiency. The development of increasingly inclusive associations comes to an end. Aristotle states the relation between the genesis and the fully formed nature of the polis succinctly at this point. As Lord's translation of 1252b30 would have it, while coming into being for the sake of living, it exists for the sake of living well. Barker's older translation, together with his explanatory glosses and italics, is also helpful here. In his words, while the polis grows for the sake of mere life and is so far and at least at that stage, still short of full self-sufficiency. It exists, when once it is fully grown, for the sake of a good life. Noting that this is one of Aristotle's most distinctive and important claims, Stully goes on to say, while the idea that the city comes into being to provide the necessities of life is relatively uncontroversial, the idea that it has the higher moral aim of bringing about the good life is decidedly questionable. But this itself is a questionable, or at least potentially, misleading reading. First of all, it is important to issue a note of caution with respect to the good life translation. For as Barnes notes in relation to a related passage in Book 3, the good life, which is the goal of the polis, is identified with eudaimonia, which is the goal of individuals. It's important to understand here that eudaimonia is not a state called happiness, as in some translations, but an activity best translated as flourishing. The polis, therefore, makes for human flourishing, which Barnes further notes for Aristotle is an activity of the soul in accordance with excellence or in accordance with virtue. By makes for is meant provides the conditions of possibility for fulfillment, not bringing about the good life, as Stali would have it, the polis does not, in other words, do your philosophizing for you, to cite Aristotle's idea of the most fulfilling activity done for its own sake. But in arriving at its telos, it allows the individual to reach his or her telos. In this respect, Barker is wrong to describe the polis as the terminus ad quem, the goal or finishing point, rather than the terminus a quo, the starting point. This is a very common misinterpretation of Aristotle, and Barker is hardly its only advocate. The intrinsic end of human life is eudaimonia. The polis and eudaimonia are not the same thing. The former is the means of the latter. In the development of yet more comprehensive associations, and in being the consummation to which those earlier associations move, the polis is the terminus ad quem, but in its role as making living well possible, it is the terminus a quo. All this means that every city or polis exists by nature for two reasons, one to do with origin and genesis, the other to do with nature and goal. 
The first of these is evident, Aristotle argues, because the polis develops from natural associations, such as the male-female union, uh, as discussed in 1252a24 to 1252b17. The second is contained in his compact sentence, again the end or final cause is the best and self-sufficiency is both the end and the best. Here Barker's older, extensively glossed translation of these words from the beginning of 1253a is the most helpful. He writes, again, and this is a second reason for regarding the state as natural, the end or final cause is the best. Now self-sufficiency, which is the object of the state to bring about, is the end and so the best, and on this it follows that the state brings about the best and is therefore natural, since nature always aims at bringing about the best. Correlative with the idea that the polis is natural is Aristotle's claim that man is by nature a political animal, this being the case to a higher degree than more gregarious animals due to our particular capacity for language, our perception of good and evil, of the just and unjust, and other similar qualities. Our political nature is also connected to the claim found at the beginning of 1253a18 that the polis is prior to the order of nature, to the family and the individual, a priority repeated in relation to the individual at the beginning of 1253a25. In the former example, this follows from Aristotle's claim that the whole is prior to or more fundamental than the parts, which do not exist in their own right but receive their meaning from the whole. From this we might conclude that for Aristotle, we are not individuals so much as parts of the body politic. In the latter example, Aristotle's point is that the isolated individuals, if he is not a god, is less than human. Given his vulnerability and how prone he is to being violent, Barker, in his translation of the beginning of what is the final sentence of Book 1, Chapter 2, goes as far as to have Aristotle refer to his integration or reintegration into society via a justifiable gloss in which he says, justice, which is his salvation, belongs to the polis. One of the clearest descriptions of the polis or city found in the politics occurs in Book 3, where Aristotle writes, It is evident that a polis is not a sharing of locality for the purpose of preventing mutual harm and promoting trade. These things must necessarily be present if a polis is to exist. But even if they are all present, a polis does not thereby exist. Rather, a polis is a sharing by households and families in a good life for the purpose of a complete and self-sufficient life. Earlier, it was suggested that this shared good life made possible the telos of individual eudaimonia, which, according to the Nicomachean ethics, is a flourishing in accordance with virtue. This connection with human excellence or virtue has specifically political implications, as Aristotle makes clear at the end of the Politics, Book 1, Chapter 2. Because man is a socio-political animal for Aristotle, that means that prior to the advent of the polis, there was always a strong natural desire for an association of this sort. That it took a particular person to first construct such an association shows that its natural roots and nature did not mean that it simply developed entirely of its own accord. Barker sums up Aristotle's understanding of the origin of the polis well when he writes, the volition and actions of human agents construct the state in cooperation with a natural imminent impulse. Justice, which is vital for the ordering of the political association and which consists in the determination of what is just, comes about in the same way. Furthermore, the determination of what is just for Aristotle is a virtue. In the introduction to this section, it was stated that the description of the polis as teleos indicates that it is an end that is not sought for the sake of some further end. This now needs to be qualified. It is true that the polis has no higher associational end for Aristotle, but his political philosophy insists that the polis is a means to the end and the virtue we call justice. In chapter 9 of The Prince, Machiavelli provides an account of the genesis of the civil principality. 
succeeding to the throne in the general state of flux that occupies the political landscape of the time, the prince, if he takes Machiavelli's advice, will mediate the actual and potential animosity that surrounds him by playing the competing interests of each faction to his best advantage. There are two main factions in Machiavelli's view, with the people in their desire to not be oppressed and commanded on one side, and the great in their desire to oppress and command on the other. The prince who is wise will break with his own group and slit the throat of the great, gaining the support of the people. This is to side with the right faction in Machiavelli's judgment. Although the people are not superior in the Aristotelian sense, as they are not unselfish or devoted to the common good, and although they may not be any less selfish than the great, nevertheless, their selfishness is not only modest but also apolitical, with the consequence that their interests are thus more easily satisfied and brought into accordance with the prince's rule. And so a wise prince, Machiavelli concludes, must think of a way by which his citizens, always and in every quality of time, have need of the state and of himself, and then they will always be faithful to him. Government is now all about a trade-off. The people are made to feel their needs and wants are met. The prince stays in power, his rule secured on a firm foundation. This is the first formulation of what, in the age of Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau, will be called the social contract, characterized by the conscious reduction of politics to self-interest, seeing the political process as a settling for compromise in what will always be imperfect circumstances. In this balancing of powers, we see the seeds for the modern conception of liberal democracy. Put more positively, this chapter represents a landmark in the history of political thought. This is the first argument by any great thinker that popular states are the best states, and that the people, rather than any elite or leadership group, such as Aristotle's favoured middle class, afford the soundest foundation for a political order. In this respect, Machiavelli is the forerunner of all modern democratic thought. No ancient or medieval political thinker had supported democracy in principle. It is true that a number of early thinkers accepted the inevitability of democracy in certain situations, the people being too strong and numerous to be forever denied the political process. But it was never seen as ideal. It was no philosopher's policy of choice. For ancient and medieval thinkers, Aristotle included, the aspiration to be political was lofty and serious. The people, by contrast, were seen as fickle, short-sighted, and humdrum in their concerns. Even in our age, in which the authority of the people is sacrosanct, these sentiments are commonly entertained and voiced. This attitude carried through into Machiavelli's day, from which his writings represent a striking departure. Thus, he marshals some impressive historical evidence against the contemporary proverb which he labels as trite that whoever founds on the people founds on mud. That Machiavelli did not have a particularly high view of the people's merits, the great clearly have more foresight and more astuteness, makes his preparedness to build a political philosophy on their participation all the more noteworthy. The argument is pragmatic. The great can be micromanaged, while the people are too vast in number for their antagonism to be reconciled without keeping them friendly. Given their size, their power must be respected. The great will come and go. The prince may make and unmake them every day. But the people are here to stay, and the political order ultimately depends on them. Having outlined the respective arguments in this manner, the conflict between Aristotle's ancient sentiment of the common good and Machiavelli's modern sentiment of self-interest might seem to accurately reflect their different accounts of the foundation and goals of the political order. However, probing more deeply into their philosophies, this reading becomes more specious and less helpful. Aristotle does not conceptualize the common good as an end completely subsuming the individual. Quite to the contrary, the polis is the terminus a quo, the appropriate environment in which each individual is capable of achieving his own eudaimonia or flourishing. The common good affords to each person his own particularity. 
In this sense, Aristotle's view can be seen to be just as concerned with self-interest as Machiavelli's. It is merely a more complex account. So where does the difference with Machiavelli really lie? Earlier, it was argued that the polis or political order for Aristotle is the means to an end, the achievement of eudaimonia and virtue. For Machiavelli, however, the virtue of the virtuoso prince becomes redefined as a means to establishing an end, the political order. This position, which is so radically different from Aristotle, represents a very fundamental break with ancient wisdom. In making virtue into a means, Machiavelli also redefines what virtue is. The prince does not look to discern and promote justice, like the wise leader of Aristotle's polis, but looks for ways to secure his position with popular support. Virtue becomes the virtuoso skill of adapting to the future and doing whatever is necessary to forge one's own fortune. From an Aristotelian perspective, this is completely cut off from the natural origin and telos of life and is thus a falsification of the true nature of political activity. For Aristotle, virtue is the end to which the political is oriented. For Machiavelli, virtue is a facet which the political encompasses. In destroying its ancient conception, trans-political standards erode, giving rise to Machiavelli's non-teleological brand of historical materialism, politics for the sake of politics. The story of the world tells of only revolution after revolution, founding after founding, deceit after deceit. It's funny how we think of Aristotle's methodological reasoning on democracy to be more pure, wholesome, and ultimately righteous, yet we prefer Machiavelli's conclusions.